Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It's so good to be God's people gathered for worship. You guys are in a in a solemn meditative mood this morning. Sometimes I walk in and they're all chatty and there's sometimes when everybody's hunkered down and ready for it. So this is one of those days. That's good. Welcome also to those who are joining us online. I do encourage those who are joining online to uh, to sign in online. Uh, say hello. Um, it's always fun to see uh, the way that, that, uh, that you guys welcome each other um, when, I, when I check back on it later and just to hear about it. Um, so it's, it's great to see and, and maybe uh, acknowledge where you're from, even if everybody else knows where you're from. Go ahead and put that in there so that it can be a form of, of ministry as well for anybody else who might happen to see that feed and, and say, wow, there's people worshiping with you from Atlanta and um, Montana and Colorado and... Washington, D.C., and all over the place. So uh, sorry if I missed anyone. Um, we're thankful that you're a part of this service, too. Um, we did have a, a rally day celebration this morning with some great cheddar biscuits. Sorry if you missed them. Uh, and it was, and sorry if you, if you were unaware that we were doing that. We tried to get the word out. Uh, we had a, a good, small, but mighty crowd for that. And some more information will come forward. We took advantage of the opportunity to go ahead and do it just a check-in because people have asked how we are doing after, uh, or after 2020, which was a, such a horrible year, and, and how are we doing this far into 2021 as a church. And when we say that, uh, people often think, well, that obviously means we're talking about the money. Um, and that's a part of it. But what we also talked about were our hopes for the congregation, our dreams for the congregation, uh, things that excite us about being God's people together. And so we'll talk more about that with everyone as the days unfold. Um, we also did acknowledge that we're going to have some new programs that will start in October. We're going to have a new uh, Sunday school class that will start at 930 uh, on Sunday mornings in October. And uh, we'll have Sunday school for, for children and also for adults. And the Sunday school class is based on a curriculum that is very kind of practical theology. Uh, what does the Bible say and how does that translate to my life, actual things that we do, practices as people who follow God. So I hope you'll be, uh, be looking for that and looking forward to that. <clears throat> um, also wanted to acknowledge the, as far as a service note, the last hymn in your bulletin is the last hymn. Last Sunday it was put in the wrong place. It was supposed to be the postlude, so you would just get familiar with the tune of it, uh, but that will, we will sing that hymn today. Uh, other upcoming things, or lots of stuff in your announcements, I encourage you to take a look at. Uh, next Friday is Pub Theology, and um, uh, we'll, we'll hear about Kairos Ministries, and talk about, that's a prison ministry that um, Bobby Melanson is involved in. Bobby's back there in the back in the checkered shirt. Uh, and so we encourage you to join for that. Um, it's, it's uh, sorry if you're online, right now we're just doing this at a local pub. Um, but you know what, you could start your own. If you wanted to, on the, on the website where the event is, um, there's also opportunity there to, on, uh, on Facebook to um, start a discussion on that topic if you wanted. I will be out of the pulpit next weekend, uh, just be out of town over the weekend, and uh, my good friend John Newman, who's worshiping with us today, will be preaching next Sunday. He said that he promises to keep it down to at least 45 minutes. So thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time as we begin our service of worship together? Okay. Well, thanks be to God for you that we are here together. Let us worship God with all that we have and all that we are right here, right now.
let us rise for the call to worship. God is the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? Let us trust in the one who strengthens us in times of trial and is the foundation of life and hope. Friends, as we consider the wonder of God's love for us, as we consider how stable our lives might be built upon the rock of Jesus, we turn to confess our sins before God, knowing that we will be forgiven. So let us join in prayer together. O God, when trials beset us, it is natural to fear. Called to be courageous, we find our faith lacking. When asked to take risks, we confess our complacency. By ignoring injustice, we hope that it will subside. You have shown us how you are God to be trusted. Leading your people, you have stayed by their side. Even Christ overcame his enemies as he hung on the cross. Forgive our reluctance to believe in your guidance and grant us the wisdom to seek refuge in Christ. Amen. Hear now, O Lord, our silent personal prayers of confession as we offer to you in the chapels of our hearts that which is known between you and us alone. And let all God's people say, Amen. <clears throat> Friends, receive the assurance of God's forgiveness. For there is nothing in all creation which can separate us from the love of God.
seated and I invite any children who aren't already up front to come and join down front with the Roy family. Are you leading the are you leading the time with young disciples yes. today? Well there you go. I thought maybe you were just thinking of yourself as a child of God Always. and took the opportunity to be down here which I invite anyone to do anytime they, they need that. If you need to come down during the children's time it is not limited by age. <laughs> so I wanted to share something with you guys a little story from when I was young when I was probably, I don't know, all y'all's ages, because it was part of my life growing up. Um, we, in my house, we had a special code to let everybody know who was coming in the door, because we lived kind of out in the country, and our house had an upstairs and a downstairs, and you just never knew where anybody was or who was coming and going, and so we had, a, had to have some way of knowing, because we didn't have cell phones. Can you imagine that? We didn't have cell phones. So we'd have some way of knowing, like if somebody walked in the door, like, who is that? Is that somebody safe? Is that somebody okay? We needed to know, because we never locked our doors. That was the other thing. So we had this little code that we did, and it went like this. You ready? It's just like that. It's very simple. And so if you were in the house, and you heard somebody whistle like that, then you would whistle back to them. And that way you knew it was somebody who was part of the family or somebody who was one of our good friends who knew the code, you know, <laughs> and it was safe. So there's something like that that's here in the church that I wanted to share with you about. Have you ever seen something like that before? Uh, like on the sticker on the back of somebody's car, sometimes we see them, yeah? What is that? What, what is that animal? It's a Jesus fish. I mean, fish would have been fine, but yes, that is a Jesus fish. So, why is it a Jesus fish? Have you ever wondered? Well, let me tell you. It's because a long time ago, you could get in trouble for following Jesus. Can you believe that? Get in trouble for following Jesus? And so, the people who were Christians, people who followed Jesus, they needed a little code so they would know if it was safe to tell somebody that they were Christian. And so they could do like the, like if they w were meeting some people, then they could just do like this and make us like in the dirt, make like a little arc. Because, you know, there was more dirt back then. Which is kind of good. I don't know. Anyway, so they would make like a little thing in the dirt and then they could step back. And then the other person from coming the other way could like do their shoe and do this, the, the other part. So there's like two arcs that make the fish. So it was like, I'm going to do my part of the fish, let me see if you do yours, and then they would do theirs, and then you knew that that person was a Christian, and you could talk to them about Jesus, and you could help each other out. So, we don't have to worry about people getting mad at us for being Christians today, which is a good thing, but it's still a good thing to let people know, hey, I'm somebody who loves Jesus, and so that's the reason why we still have symbols like the, the Jesus fish around. Now, the other one is an anchor. That's kind of a weird thing to have in a church, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I can talk more about the anchor another time. And you might talk, I don't know, y'all might talk about it a little bit too. But, um, but one thing that's kind of cool about the anchor, do you see a cross that's in the anchor, that's part of the anchor? It's like hidden in there, yeah? That's one of the reasons why the anchor is something that we use in the church, is because it has that cross in there. So, yes, sir? I see a symbol. You see a what? Oh, yeah, uh-huh. The bottom part of it does that on the anchor? Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's smart. Cool. All right, well, let me, uh, how about we share a prayer, and then you guys can go, and y'all can talk about those symbols a little bit more, and other things, too. Are we going to hold hands? No. No? Okay, we're not going to hold hands today. Okay. All right. Uh, can y'all repeat after me? Yeah? Okay. Hi, God. Hi, God. It's us. We love you. Thank you for symbols and signs that tell us about your love that we can use to tell others too. Amen. Thanks, guys.
let us pray. God of hope and inspiration, enlighten us with your truth as we open our hearts and minds to receive your word. Chase away all thoughts of despair and fill our hearts anew. Anoint us with your spirit so that we may share the love and faith that we have received through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture lesson uh, is from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 16 through 20, and you can find it on page 221 of your New Testament in your Pew Bible, if you would like to read along. As we read, I encourage you to look for the ways this passage may connect with the symbol of the anchor on the banner to my left. Listen also for whatever the Spirit of God may reveal to you through this reading today from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 16 through 20. Human beings, of course, swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath given as confirmation puts an end to all dispute. In the same way, when God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it by, the, by an oath, so that though two unchangeable things in which it is impossible that God would prove false, we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the first reading of God's holy word. Our second scripture reading comes from Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 4, verses 17 to 19. You can find that on page 61 of your New Testament, New Testament in the Pew Bible if you'd like to read along. Uh, it'll probably be a different page at home, though. <coughs> um, this section is uh, reading uh, where Jesus is in the temple after uh, having been tempted in the wilderness, and he's gone back to Nazareth and uh, is given the scroll and, and reads and then sits to teach. Uh, some have said this was kind of, a, kind of like Jesus' mission statement, his, his first public statement of what his ministry is supposed to be about, according to the Gospel of Luke. Listen now um, for what the Spirit might have to say to you through the reading of God's Word. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today is the second out of four sermons about the symbols of our banners um, and the related scriptures and concepts that kind of go along with them throughout the history of the church. If you're new to our fellowship, then you might not know these were recently created for the church by a member who lives part of the year in Colorado and has, uh, has become part of our online congregation since the outbreak of COVID-19. So hi, Sonny. We're glad that you're out there. I hope Jerry's doing okay. Um, I mentioned last week that the worship committee gave her some, some themes and asked her to just kind of let the Spirit guide her, which we truly believe she's done with these really beautiful, wonderful banners that she's made. Now, Sunny chose some ancient symbols of the church that we often only see on our Christmas tree at Advent. And so when they first came out, some people said, well, are those Advent banners? Well, no, they're green. Advent's purple. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Um, but, but these are some common symbols that we see during certain times of the year, and, uh, and we felt like it would be good to make sure that we understand these symbols as more than just a creative design. Now, of course, there's great value in any act of creativity, because we are created in the image 
of the creator of all things. But these symbols, these symbols are, are here in this place to tell us about our relationship with God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all that is, was, and ever shall be. And this week we have an anchor and a fish. You're probably used to seeing the fish. You might even have one on your car. I, I'm not sure. It's, uh, it's probably the most common and easily marketable symbols of Christian faith outside of the cross, especially when it comes to stickers and, and emblems for cars. There are fishes with crosses in the middle of them. There are fish with schools of fish that have a couple of larger fish to show that it's a Christian family. That's kind of fun. Sometimes the name of Jesus is inside the fish, the actual name, Jesus. And sometimes the Greek word for fish, ichthus, like we have here, is inside the fish. We're very dedicated to this fish. We have fish inside of our fish. Even if the fish doesn't make sense to you as to why we would have a fish as a symbol for Jesus, and why in the world we would have an anchor as a symbol for Jesus, most people recognize the fish. Anchor, not so much. Now, the word anchor is only used once as a metaphor for faith in the whole Bible, and we had that in our passage today. An anchor for our soul, the passage said. But apart from that, Paul talks about using anchors to weather a, a storm that eventually leaves everyone on, on the boat alive, but wrecked on the shore. That's about all you have for anchors, at least in the New Testament. And I think that's how a lot of us feel these days. Alive, but wrecked on the shore. I realize it's kind of a luxury for me to say that. You know, Lafayette still has some issues left over from the floods of 2016 that are related to our, our drainage issues and our, and our housing stock uh, that we're still trying to recover from. But over the last two years, we've been in the clear where Lake Charles got hit with Lily and Delta, and exactly a year later, dozens of small communities around New Orleans were ravaged by Ida on the 16th anniversary of Katrina. One of those communities is a Native American community, and, and our congregation is going to be supporting that particular community as we move forward. You'll hear more about it, uh, but they are a part of the Choctaw Nation, and um, 30 or, or 7 out of there are 30 homes are no, or what, sorry, seven, there are 30 homes in that village, and only seven of them are still livable. All of them have damage, and I'm not sure if any of them have power yet or not. Um, and, you know, if you think about that, we, uh, we were told to be prepared for two to three days without power, and a lot of folks have been going for three weeks or more without power. Um, so be in prayer for them and, and know that we're working on ways that we can partner with others and, uh, and create some, some assistance. Um, you know, it, it, along with that, just living in this region, there have been five named, named storms, hurricanes, category four and five storms, that have hit between Florida and Texas along the Gulf, Gulf since just 2017. Now you add to that the homecoming from Afghanistan that was not what anyone wanted except for those who are seizing power in our absence, and all the culture wars that assail our ability to follow biblical mandates for care for immigrants like we have in Leviticus 19.34 and, and biblical mandates to manage the health of our community like we have in, in Leviticus 13.45 and 46. I imagine between all of these different influences that feel like nothing but bad news that we might either feel like we're washed up on a shore or adrift at sea and really, really needing an anchor right about now. Now, I don't know how well the original recipients of this letter might have understood the concept of an anchor. They weren't necessarily a seafaring people in general, but clearly enough of them did that it made sense to use that analogy. These were knowledgeable people the letter went to. It, it's unclear exactly which community or to whom it went, but it was written in the style of Paul, in Paul's letters. Most believe it was intended to be shared among those followers of the way of Jesus who were also Jewish. That's why it's called Letter to the Hebrews. Now, in the, the first part of chapter 16, the letter lays out some assumptions. This is before the part that we read. The letter lays out some assumptions about 
their belief and compares them, the, the people who the letter is addressed to, compares them to a well-tended garden that is either going to yield a good crop or thorns. Thorns are, of course, useless to anyone but themselves and will be purged from the ground, perhaps even with fire, so that they can at least chemically enrich the ground. Those of us who live near sugarcane fields know what that's like. There's a certain season in the year where there are little, little tufts of black snow flying through the air from where they've been burning the sugarcane fields. And that's what it talks about in the scripture about the thorns, that at least they could be burned to enrich the ground. Now, that sounds kind of threatening if you think of us as the ones yielding good fruit or thorns, until you remember that we're still the ground, and we might have another chance to produce a good crop after the farmer removes the selfishness of the thorns. And that's kind of the point of our passage. In verses 16 to 18, we have the assurance that God is trustworthy even when we are not, and God has promised us redemption through Jesus Christ. In verse 19, we're told that the promise of God to redeem is like an anchor of hope that we can depend on. We can depend on this. And then later in chapter 11, verse 1, we're reminded that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. There's that hope again, that hope that we need. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the assurance of things unseen. And again, in Romans 8, 24 and 25, we're reminded for in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hope. The anchor represents hope. The anchor reminds us that we can trust in these promises of God. The anchor reminds us that we can wait out the storm. The anchor assures us that even if we end up washed up on the shore, we will survive. And not only that, but we will once again thrive if we trust in the redemption that has been given through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now let's talk a little about this Christ Jesus. Hebrews 6.20 ends by calling him a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And that gets unpacked in the next few verses, which I encourage you to read later. Uh, it makes, makes a lot more sense after you read those. But this essentially means that in Jesus are combined both the priestly role of an intermediary between us and God and the leadership of someone with divine authority. That's who Melchizedek was. He was someone who had a particular role in restoring peace, and he established a treaty over breaking bread and sharing wine long before the Passover. Now, we might explore more about Melchizedek on another day because that gets into some, uh, uh, into what it means to be faithful and as a community and tithing and all those things. So we'll probably talk about that another day. But for now, let's just say that Jesus was and is God's anointed one who restores peace in our lives, even here and even now. And that takes us to the next symbol of faith. That fish we talked about with the children, how in times of persecution, followers would draw one part of it and then somebody else would draw the other as a way to tell who was, who was, fake, who was uh, a safe and safe person to be around. But it's still a fish. And it makes one wonder maybe, why, why a fish? It may be connected in some way to Jesus' invitation to become fishers of people or the fact that his disciples were all fishers before they became fishers of people. It may have been some other insider thing that we've lost to time. But the reason that most historians believe that Christians used a fish, and many still use a fish today, is because the Greek word for fish, ichthus, is an acronym. Each letter stands for a word that forms not only the name of Jesus, but the title of Jesus. Ius Christos Theo Vius Soter. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Each of these words tell us something about the work of God through the person of Jesus. Jesus was a man, a person. Christos means anointed. Theo Vius means Son of God. The anointed person named Jesus was of God in a way that no one else was. 
He was God's self-revelation. And why did God do this? In order to save us. He is the soter, the one who saves. All that in a fish. How amazing is God? Well, the Christian fish isn't necessarily found anywhere in the Bible. It's something that came up as a unique expression of what the Bible tells us about Jesus as God's self-revelation. All right, cool. So that's everything in a nutshell. Let's put it all on our cards, and God will be happy about that, right? Well, maybe there's more to it than that. And I'm not saying anything bad about people who have these as bumper stickers. I I used to have one myself at one point. I kind of like them, really. I think it's a great statement of faith. But what really matters is the action that goes with the statement of faith. What really matters is that we don't lose sight of the who the fish points to and what it means to, for Jesus to be God's self-revelation so that we might be saved. We've been given this anchor of faith in Jesus, but what's the point, right? Well, all we have to do is to look to, God, to, to Luke's gospel and see what Jesus points to as his understanding of his purpose. The blind are given sight, the poor and oppressed are cared for, and the year of Jubilee, the forgiveness of debt, is declared. In fact, Jesus repeats this again in 722 when John sends disciples to ask if Jesus is the one that they've been waiting for. Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. Here's what it all comes down to for you and me. If Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, and if we are Christians, literally that meant little Christs or Christ-like in origin, if we're Christians, then we have been anointed with that same mission. And so while the anchor reminds us that we can rely on God, the Christian fish reminds us that God has chosen to rely on us. Chosen to rely on us to proclaim the favor of God for those who are in need, for those who are oppressed, for those who may be washed up and washed out by the storms of life. But fear not. God does not expect us to do it alone, like someone yammering out online or on a train or on a street corner with no concern for the people that they're talking to. God has given us one another. And God has given us God's self in the person of Jesus, whose body is the church, you and me together. Now, I hope you'll be encouraged and comforted by the fact that God has chosen you for God's team. I don't know if y'all have seen that commercial. It's a really silly commercial, but it has Charles Barkley in it. And there's like all these children that are choosing who's going to be on their team. And one of them chooses Charles Barkley, who towers over all of them by like double. And he gets so excited. I knew you were going to pick me. I've still got it. Hopefully that's how you feel every Sunday when we say our prayer of confession, when we read the Gospels, when we realize that God wants us on God's team. God believes that each of us are worth saving on the shore, even if it's just so that we can go and tell others that we're alive and thanks be to God for it. Now I invite you to join me in giving thanks for God's grace and mercy and asking for God's blessing upon these banners. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, you are our strength when we are weak. You are the anchor for our faith and the source of all hope. Let every stitch of these banners stand as a testimony of your love and calling so that we might demonstrate grace and mercy and restoration. We pray these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who is your Son and our Savior. Amen. Let us stand and sing and give glory to God.
master and my God assist me to proclaim to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name to God all glory praise and love be now and ever given by saints below and saints above the our faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaim the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel, unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and given his life for the sins of the world. God raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. As we turn to God in prayer, let us lift up those joys of our hearts, uh, those concerns that we might share and bear together. I uh, would like to acknowledge we had a great discussion for those who met this morning. It was, a, like I said earlier, a small but mighty crew, uh, but it gave me a lot of, of hope in this congregation and in the ministry that we share. Um, one of the, some of the things that were lifted up from that were uh, that, one, that we were able to do new things over the last couple of years. Um, maybe we didn't do them to the level that, you know, a congregation that can afford a production crew can do, but, um, but we did new things, and we were able to, to make it through and to expand how we can reach out into the world and ministry. Um, we also continued to host uh, groups that were involved in recovery through our partnership with uh, Nahama and, um, and uh, AmeriCorps. Uh, most recently, we had some of our Presbyterian disaster assistance regional coordinators that came in and surveyed the area and stayed in our, in our building. Um, we were able to provide shelter for a family during Hurricane Laura. Uh, just all kinds of things that were lifted up that we've been able to do to not only care for one another, but also still be an active, caring part of this uh, community that we're in. So those are just some highlights from this morning. It was, it was a really wonderful um, discussion. Uh, there was also a frank discussion about our finances, and uh, we'll be communicating more of that with, with the congregation as well. Um, but, uh, but take heart. We got a lot of, lot of love in this room and, uh, and online and in this community still. Um, Richard, uh, I believe, had some, met some, uh, you had some teeth taken out, so we were praying for you on Wednesday, so I'm glad to see you here. Are there others who would like to lift something up or someone up in prayer? Carol? Oh, good. Okay. For those online who might not have heard that, uh, Nancy and Bill Rust's, um, you said her granddaughter, granddaughter, Avery, Avery, um, was in the hospital uh, and is now home. Um, Oh, she was in ICU. She's out of ICU, still in the hospital, still needs prayers either way. (laughs) Pray for Avery, please. (laughs) What else might we lift up? Okay, Tim, Tim will be traveling in an area where he will not be reachable by cell phone. And uh, even though some of us grew up without cell phones, it's still a little scary. <laughs> in the mountains, he's just him and a stick. That's all it is. <laughs> he's probably having a great time. All right, of course, we lift up those communities that have been affected by Hurricane Ida, and we give thanks for those 
uh, amongst, amongst you who have contributed to that effort, but also for, uh, for those of you who have posted online and encouraged people beyond our reach, beyond our congregation to, to contribute. Um, I know that uh, I had some members of my family who've contributed and uh, we're continuing to collect resources that will go directly to support the, um, the Choctaw tribe there in Homa. Um, so we'll be putting more information out about that, but just know that anything you give that will go directly to that. Um, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we carry with us so many thoughts and feelings of anxiety and hope. Um, help us to be anchored in our hope. Let our souls be anchored in that hope that we have through you, through your love for us, through your demonstration of love that we find in Christ Jesus. Hear us now as we pray in his name as we've been taught about the important things, the essential things. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Again, I want to uh, give thanks for those who continue to contribute online. Acknowledge for the congregation, there is a plate in the back of the sanctuary for uh, your donation on your way out. Um, and encourage you to know that you are, uh, your generosity is a reflection of God's love and will be something important for someone else. Um, if nothing else, for the continuance of God's church, the witness to God's love through Jesus Christ. But there is so much more that we're involved in. Our partnership in Cuba the nominational partnerships that, we're, that we impact ministries around the world, and also things in our community right here and across town. Uh, the Wesley Student Ministry, um, Family Promise, the, the Food Bank um, with UCO, United Christian Outreach, these are all things that we're supporting. Um, so I encourage you to give generously and, um, and faithfully.
peace and justice. In Christ, you bring light to illumine the nations. We come in response to his call to us, seeking to follow and fulfill his commands. Accept the gifts we offer as symbols of our commitment and sanctify them so that they may be used as you desire. Use us as instruments of your will. May all that we do be in accord with Christ. Amen. Friends, now let us join together in the charge and benediction. Let hope be the anchor of our souls, for we have been anointed in the way of Jesus. As we go out to proclaim good news to those who need it, may we be restored, encouraged, and sustained by the love, mercy, and power of God, now and always. Amen. Amen.